I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to all of you. Um, thank you for joining the September version of the ROAR bi-monthly community call. Um, if you're just joining us, as I've uh, said already, um, please do introduce yourself in the chat, tell us who you are, where you're joining from, and uh, anything about your interest in ROAR, including uh, where you might, uh, including how you might be planning to use it or how you are already using it. I think lots of people are always very interested in that. Um, I wanted to start here just with a, a quotation from a, a book that I've been re reading recently uh, called How Infrastructure Works Inside the Systems That Shape Our World. It's written by an engineering professor um, who's at Olin College in Massachusetts in the United States. And it's really quite fascinating. I mean, a lot of it is about things like bridges and plumbing and streets. Uh, but, uh, of course, we at Roar consider ourselves to be part of scholarly communication infrastructure. And I was particularly struck by this quotation from um, the first chapter, uh, talking about how a great many infrastructure, infrastructural entities are networks, which we do think of uh, as being true for Roar. And also just about the kind of uh, synergy, if you will, of adoption of these things, benefits that go beyond the in individual. Um, so we think of ROAR, actually, I do think of ROAR, to be honest, as a public good. So I like this quotation, um, emphasizing that aspect of ROAR. And, um, and of course, we like to, um, we think one of the main benefits of ROAR is that it is indeed universally accessible. So just just some food for thought before we get started. And I do recommend the book, quite nice. Uh, meanwhile, here is our agenda for today. We're going to give you just some uh, general updates. Uh, we're going to hear from our technical lead, Liz Krasnarich, about um, what's going on technically with ROAR. Uh, we will hear from um, our curation team uh, about especially our recent proposal to add additional external identifiers to ROAR. Um, I'll give my usual rundown of who's uh, new to the ROAR community in terms of adopting ROAR or even just generating new features with ROAR. And then we're, we're gonna hear two very exciting presentations. Um, we have two representatives of the Office of the Government of the Czech Republic here uh, with us today, and as well as some uh, members of the Czech National Technical Library um, who are going to talk about their efforts to track uh, research, you know, Czech research and uh, how they manage that in their CRIS system. And then we're going to hear uh, from Tilla Edmonds, uh, the Director of uh, Content Management for Web of Science at Clarivate, uh, talking about their uh, imminently uh, soon to be launched uh, ROAR integration. And then we'll, as usual, have hopefully a few minutes for your questions. So we hold these community calls every two months. Anyone is free to join. Um, we're really just, they're just meant to uh, let you know what's going on with ROAR, as well as to, as I say, feature people who are using ROAR uh, or who have just adopted ROAR, who are doing new things with ROAR. We think that's always valuable for everybody. Um, we announce them on our website. We announce them on the ROAR community forum, um, which you have not joined. Uh, we encourage you to join. Really, it's, uh, it gets fairly light traffic, um, usually one or two messages a month. I'm just letting you know about things that are going on with ROAR. We do encourage you to ask questions in the chat and to talk to one another. Uh, we're happy to do that. We do record these calls and we'll send you all the recordings, uh, the recording and the slides afterward, as well as posting them publicly. Uh, we do have a code of conduct um, that we ask you to abide by. And we do also encourage you to click uh, the show captions button uh, in Zoom to show captions in your own language if you like. You can always submit requests or bug reports on our roadmap, which is openly available on GitHub. You can post questions and share information in our discussion channels, including the community forum, which I mentioned. If you're really specifically interested in technical updates, especially uh, changes or difficulties with the API, we encourage you to join our technical forum. And of course, you can always submit curation requests. Again, that's all open information available on GitHub. You can always say, please fix the information in this record. Please add a new record. We invite everybody to do that. And then, of course, just always get in touch with us and tell us about how you're using ROAR or planning to use ROAR. All right, so we'll give just some general news. 
at this point. The first thing we'd like to do is welcome a new member to the ROAR team. So for those of you who have been coming to these calls uh, for quite a while, you may be familiar with those of us on the ROAR team. There, uh, until August, there were four of us. We have Director Maria Gould, we have a technical lead, Liz Krasnarich, we have our former curation lead, Adam Buttrick, who is still with us as a um, uh, product manager, still working on curation activities. And then I am technical community manager for Roar. But we have a new member of the Roar team, uh, Riley Marsh. Riley is our new metadata manager. She joined last month and she will be taking over a lot of the work that Adam has been doing so wonderfully for the last couple of years, supporting the day to day activities of curating the Roar registry, including triaging a really, really high number of incoming requests for changes to Roar data, um, handling them with aplomb, um, and then working, of course, with uh, members of the Roar Curation Advisory Board. We have a number of members of that board with us on the call today. Riley is based at Crossref, as I am, and will also be contributing to metadata schema activities there. She's based in New Orleans. Um, there is a hurricane currently coming to the United States, which is going to miss Riley, we uh, uh, are sure. But she has recently, most recently worked at, uh, at Tulane University there in the Digital Scholarship and Initiatives Department. Riley, can you just unmute and say hi real quick? Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here today. <laughs> it's great to meet everyone. We are thrilled to have you. Just some other general news. Um, we uh, had mentioned this on our last call and we've um, put it on our social media and, and so on, but we were actually unironically really thrilled to be nominated for an, uh, or well, we nominated ourselves, but we made it to the finals for uh, the ALPSP Innovation and Publishing Award. There were only four finalists. I don't know how many applicants, uh, but we thought that was uh, really wonderful. Um, the winner was the Paper Mill Alarm uh, by a company called Clear Skies. And I think actually a win for Paper Mill Alarm was also a, will, a win for Roar. Uh, we did an interview with Adam Day last year, who's the CEO and founder of Clear Skies, about this tool that he's created, suite of tools really, to detect paper mill activity in scholarly research. And he is a big Roar fan, relies on Roar, um, and talks a lot about, again, that public benefit, Roar as a public good, uh, Roar as an essential, clean, big, open data set that helps solve problems such as detecting paper mill activity. So we were really thrilled about that. Um, we think it was a good thing for, for Roar, and we're very grateful to ALPSP for the consideration. Just a couple of upcoming events, um, uh, some of which are, are, are very popular. So we've uh, partnered with for science, uh, which is a company that does a lot of contrib uh, contribute, uh, makes a lot of contributions to DSpace, the open source uh, repository software that many libraries use. And they have specifically incorporated Roar into the latest versions of both DSpace and DSpace Chris, which is actually a, a Chris system that is similar to but different from the DSpace repository software. So we're um, doing a webinar with them to talk about uh, how they've used Roar, sort of a dedicated, instead of just a short presentation at the end of one of these calls, it's sort of a full hour about uh, these features and um, users of DSpace who either are or are tempted to use these features. And we've already got, I think, nearly 90 registrants for that call. Um, it's a very popular software in libraries, so we've seen a lot of uptake of that and a lot of interest in this affiliation information. We also have an ACRL choice webinar coming up in November. I don't have access to the registration stats for that, but this is going to be essentially an introduction to ROAR um, for librarians who are involved in gathering research intelligence for their university. Essentially, what uh, research is there? Are there faculty publishing? What collaborations can they um, foster? That sort of thing. And we're doing that in conjunction with Open Alex. Um, because open Alex is a sort of a really promising new research intelligence tool and typically those have hundreds of registrants we think so it's going to be quite a large and important webinar and then of course we have our last community call of the year coming up in late november just wanted to call attention to a couple of recent blog posts as well um, we have a blog post up that's really uh, mostly talking about repository systems, not DSpace in this case, but uh, generalist repository systems such as Figshare, Zenodo, 
and uh, Dryad who are already using Roar specifically for the purpose of identifying funders, which is a sort of an emerging use case for Roar. Um, so uh, please read that if you're interested in Roar for that use case. Um, we also did a case study with Optica Publishing Group. We have both Sasha and Chris on the call today, I think, talking about their really admirable um, dedication to good metadata in their uh, DOI metadata in particular. So we've talked with them about how and why they do that. And then a very popular uh, sort of series of posts about metadata matching, meaning automatic methods of matching in particular text strings to ROAR IDs, or in some cases, you know, other, other kinds of text to other kinds of identifiers. But Adam, who can't be with us today, and Dominika Totjek from uh, Crossref have both been writing posts about how they do this and why, and um, just things to know about doing these kinds of things automatically with uh, machine learning tools. Uh, and now I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Liz Krasnarich, who is going to tell us about uh, technical updates. Liz, I'm gonna give you slide control so that you should be able to manage these yourself. Thanks, Amanda. There we go. Um, so hi, everyone. As Amanda mentioned, I am Liz Krasnarich. I am the technical lead for Roar. And today, I really just have one major technical update to talk about, which is something that we've discussed a couple of times at these meetings in the past. Um, so if you were at the last meeting, um, you may have heard me talk about the concept of API credentialing. Um, and some background behind that is uh, the Roar API receives pretty heavy and constant use and ever increasing uh, use, but it is a completely open and anonymous API. Um, and we're getting to the point where we have some not so nice use of the, the API that is starting to occasionally infringe on um, sort of the, the community use of the API. We see a lot of cases where a handful of IP addresses will um, come in and send lots and lots of requests for a sustained period of time, just right up under our current API rate limit. And it really causes a lot of resource um, usage and slows down the, uh, the API a little bit. So we have multiple uh, kind of ways to address this. And those we're, we're looking at um, a bunch of different improvements to maintain stability and, and functionality of the API for everyone. But one part of that, um, that set of approaches is adding um, some, some additional information requirements for use of the, the API so that we can better identify um, behaviors in the API and have an additional bit of information beyond just IP addresses to help identify some of that not so nice behavior and um, also allow us to get in touch with people. We also see a lot of, of behaviors where, um, where we notice that the API could be used much more efficiently, queries that are generating lots of errors, um, people sending the same requests over and over and over when the data doesn't actually change. So we could potentially um, help folks out a little bit by being able to contact them, um, which we don't have the opportunity to do at this time because we don't have any information beyond IP address about um, who's using our API and for what. So we initially introduced this idea as API credentialing. We've changed the, um, the framing of it a little bit because we're not actually talking about doing true credentialing in terms of authenticating like real robust authentication and limiting access to resources. What we're really talking about is identifying API clients. So we've switched the, um, the language we're using to talk about this to API client identification. And then we're also talking about um, rate limiting. All this is to say we is that we have a proposal um, about how we might approach handling API client identification and, um, and rate limiting open for public comment through the 4th of October. So for those of you who are um, more on the technical side and like to dig into these details, the link to that document is there and Amanda has posted it in the chat. So please go through and take a look at um, what we're proposing here. This has been open for, uh, for a couple of weeks. You may have seen this posted on our blog and in some of our other communication 
channels, but you have just a little over a week to continue to add comments and, and weigh in here. Uh, but what we are um, what we are suggesting in this document, um, so we have a current rate limit of 2,000 requests per five minutes um, just for everyone, for all anonymous users in the, the API. What we're suggesting is that to continue to receive this relatively high rate limit, API clients, so API users, will need to identify themselves. We have two options proposed in this document that are what I would consider really lightweight um, approaches. One is just adding a mail to parameter with requests that includes an email address as a, in a URL parameter. The other one is a, about one step beyond that, which actually would involve registering for an API key and sending that along with um, requests. The registration um, we're aiming for really low overhead and low hurdles to that registration um, in terms of both what information we require, which would basically be an email address that we can contact for issues and that we can send the API key to. Um, we, at this point, are not even planning to put it behind a login because we, um, A, don't have any resources that you in, in our UI that you log into right now. And it requires usually a level of support that we are not looking to um, to delve into at this moment. So we're looking at lightweight as possible um, options to give us a little more information about um, API use and users to help manage some of these um, stability issues and keep the Roar API running well for everyone. Um, we will continue to, um, to allow anonymous requests. We aren't trying to limit um, public access to the Roar APIs. And in fact, we're trying to keep barriers to entry as low as possible. However, um, we will then start to rate limit anonymous requests to a much lower rate limit. And in the proposal, we're suggesting 50 requests per minute. And this would be plenty to allow um, actual human users who might be typing things into um, type ahead and drop down forms uh, to do that without any rate limiting and just things like experimenting and trying out um, queries in the API. Um, so we're looking for feedback on those two options in the document to give us feedback, add your comments in the proposal document. Um, and just to reiterate a little bit of background that I've shared um, before, uh, what we're facing is that it's kind of a game of whack-a-mole to try to um, combat impolite behavior on an IP address by IP address basis. It's a lot of me you know, looking at our log information and our monitoring every time resource usage, usage starts to get um, a little bit high. It then becomes a, a search game to, figure, to find the IP addresses. Um, and if they're really causing problems with resources, then to rate limit them further or block them. But we have some cases where people are using proxy services that make it easy to change your IP address. So it's like a daily game of of whack-a-mole to figure out um, which IPs are causing the problems now. And we just want to have a little bit uh, more insight to give us some more tools to control that. Uh, I will say some other things we're looking at, of course, um, we can uh, dedicate more resources uh, to handling increasing requests, but that's kind of a never ending process. You add more, more resourcing and then the not so great behaviors continue and you just keep adding and adding and it costs, costs more and more. Um, and we're also looking at um, moving our AWS services on to API gateway so that we can have even more fine grain control and more caching. Um, those are other things. This is just one um, aspect of a solution. All that is to say, please check out the document, um, add your comments or send it on to uh, technical folks on your team who might have an interest in it. We are likely planning a very soft rollout of this, um, which will not involve requiring uh, this API client identification immediately in the near term. What we'll do is you know, build this, beta test it a little bit, enable it as a, a feature, and then set an actual date um, with a reasonable 
period to give people um, some time to actually add this extra bit of information in the request before the API rate limit is actually implemented based on that identification criteria. All right, that is it for me. If you have any questions right now, um, pop them in the chat and I will answer them. Um, thank you, Liz. Um, I'm gonna hand it over now uh, to Riley, who is going to uh, give us just a, a, a brief a couple of updates uh, on curation. I wanted to mention too that Adam Buttrick uh, was attending the Barcelona conference in Paris, uh, so he's on his way back on an airplane, which is why he can't be with us. Riley, take it away. All right. Hey everybody, Riley here, filling in for Adam. Um, for anybody just hopping on the call, I'm the new metadata manager for Roar based at Crossref. And um, of course, it's great to be here today. Uh, I wanted to share some updates about the feedback we got for adding the new external identifiers to the metadata schema. Um, first of all, the feedback period is now closed. And I'm happy to report that there was significant interest in adding the new external identifiers. Um, there weren't really any major objections raised, and um, the uh, proposed approach does align well with our existing work policies and practices. So um, we had a few different types of identifiers that garnered interest, um, a lot of national level identifiers with some from France and the Czech Republic, um, as well as the SAML entity IDs. Um, there's also interest in a lot of the funding related identifiers like the European participant identifier codes and the RIDs for overlap with uh, core facilities. Um, Adam, Liz and I will be evaluating the proposed new external identifiers uh, through December um, and we'll be consulting with the curation board and reaching out to any individual requesters to add any additional details as needed. Um, if we asked for more information on the new external ID requests that you've submitted in the ROAR uh, roadmap repo, please follow up with us in the issues. Um, for our evaluation, we'll be assessing data accessibility, we'll be checking for basic access and ensuring that there are no license restrictions, um, and we'll also be looking at data quality, focusing on having a consistent schema and on the use of controlled fields, as well as ensuring completeness and ongoing maintenance. Um, a key factor in this evaluation will be our ability to reliably reconcile data sources with Roar. Um, and we might also have some additional development needs as we move forward. Um, including creating new data extraction or cleaning processes for certain identifiers and data sources. Um, and we'll also need to do some minor work on the schema file API and data dump generation code to accommodate new ID types. Um, per versioning policy, new ID types do not require a new API version. Um, however, they will only be included in version two um, and beyond new to the, due to the standardization of the external IDs field in that version. Um, and uh, finally, I just wanted to remind you all that requests for the new external identifiers can still be submitted um, via the ROAR roadmap. So you can use the external ID issue template in the ROAR roadmap GitHub repository. Um, and that's it from me. All right. Thank you so much, Riley. Um, great to hear from you. I'm just going to give a quick rundown before we get into our, our presentations of uh, adoption updates. A couple of uh, really interesting new uh, adoptions that we've heard about. So there's a company called InfoEd Global that I think has actually been working for a couple of years on ROAR integration. They produce what is actually a very, very widely used database of funding opportunities, um, especially I think United States. I don't know if it's limited to the United States, but this is a database that a lot of university libraries subscribe to, um, and it gives their faculty the opportunity to say, here are some grants that you might uh, apply to. So I just learned about this a couple of days ago. We're gonna get more information about that uh, from them, but uh, I think they're using Roar mainly for institutional disambiguation. Um, classic use of ROAR. Um, they also have a research management uh, software. So for instance, when you are a researcher and you get a grant, 
There's various things you have to do for compliance and InfoWeb produces uh, some software to deal with that. They've integrated Roar into that too. So again, looking forward to learning more about that. The Genomes Online Database has integrated Roar. This is actually a, a Department of Energy uh, initiative, uh, but they do work fairly closely with the NIH as well because it is biomedical data. Um, that's pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, a couple of new features. This is sort of a new uh, use of Roar, and we have Anne Lote, I think, with us on the, the call today. Uh, but Open Alex, which has a, a sort of an institutional model based uh, very heavily around Roar, has partnered um, uh, with the French government, essentially, to uh, uh, produce this tool called Works Magnet, which allows people to essentially um, look at that metadata matching result. So OpenAlex uses machine learning to say this text string matches this Roar ID, um, but these things make mistakes. Um, so one of the things that this tool can do is allow humans to go in and say, actually, no, that's not the correct Roar ID, that's a mismatch. It does other things as well. It allows people to associate works with their own institution, um, but it's uh, quite an interesting little tool. Um, glad to, glad to know, see that happen. Um, ORCID has recently um, launched a feature that it calls verified email domains, and they were using Roar data to facilitate that feature. Essentially, they were looking um, for domain information from Roar, matching that to existing email addresses in ORCID records and saying, clearly, so-and-so has a harvard.edu email address. They are clearly associated with Harvard. Um, so that's really great, and it's sort of increasing those trust markers uh, that are so important for research integrity. Um, and then, uh, this is a, a couple of months ago now, but uh, Crossref has a really nice little uh, UI feature called participation reports, where publishers in particular, really anyone can go and look up a publisher, any Crossref member, and see how good uh, their metadata is just overall. So one of the things that they did was add a metric for Roar as well as for just text affiliations um, to those to those reports. So you can go to crossref.org slash prep, I believe is the URL, and look at, uh, to see uh, how good um, various publishers metadata is. Um, if you have not uh, told us about how you're using or planning to use Roar, we do have a form here um, where you can just let us know. Actually, you can just email me, amanda at roar.org, tell us about how you're using Roar. Um, and then we just have a few charts as well. Um, this chart goes up and up and up. Uh, these are cross-ref records with Roar IDs. We're getting very close to 150,000, so that's great. Um, and then we're breaking this down by type. Um, I, I think I, I've mentioned this a couple of times before, but originally it was mostly grants in Crossref that had Roar IDs, just because of the, uh, the way Crossref had set up its grant registration forms and so on. Those were Roar enabled. Um, and so a lot of the funders who are now registering DOIs for their grants were using uh, Roar IDs for those. But journal articles uh, quite a while ago began to overtake all other content types, which is, I think, as it should be. Um, so we have on our, our leaderboard here, um, Optica Publishing Group, American Physical Society, and eLife Sciences are all doing a great job providing Roar IDs to Crossref in DOI metadata. Um, data site affiliations uh, that use Roar, uh, 2.22 million, again, going way up all the time. And as a percentage of affiliation identifiers, Roar is, again, creeping ever closer to 90%. Uh, most of the, the, that 11% of data site um, data providers that are, are using Grid uh, tend to be Figshare installations, and I think they will catch up soon. Um, ORCID records is something that I've been uh, measuring recently. And this, again, is like just, just a tremendous, tremendous increase. If you'll notice, this chart really only goes back to April of this year. This is only since April of 2024 um, that ORCID records with Roar IDs somewhere in there have gone from uh, 1.46 uh, million to 2.77 million. Not quite doubling, but um, getting very close just in, over the course of essentially six months. Um, and this, again, you can kind of see this is uh, out of all ORCID records, um, we just came, went over the 40% mark, uh, mark. So for 
for any ORCID record that has uh, organization identifiers of some kind in it, um, ROAR is now accounting for 40% of those organizational identifiers. And then this is a chart that comes from a, a blog post that ORCID recently put out. Um, ORCID has very generously um, supported ROAR financially this year, as well as in previous years. And this is a chart that comes um, from their sort of internal data. This is, um, this is measuring affiliations, not records, and it's doing it only on a year by year basis. So for, you know, an ORCID record will typically have multiple affiliations. You know, you've, here's your work history, here's your um, education history, all of those things are counted as affiliations in, in ORCID records. And then, so for new affiliations that are created in records, you can see that um, ROAR is taking over what you might think of as a market share. So that's great. And we are very grateful to ORCID for their support. Um, so with that, um, we're going to hand things over to our guests, and we're first going to hear um, from uh, a representative of the Office of the Government of Czech Republic. We have Tarash Hrendash here um, to tell us about um, how their their work uh, on their their national CRIS system. Uh, Tarash, I'm going to give you um, uh, the ability to control the slides, so you can just forward them yourself. Uh, but just if you have any trouble with that, just let me know, and I will advance the slides for you. Tarash? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Hi, everyone. So, yes, I'm I'm from Czech Republic. We are working at the Czech government a lot with bibliometric data and struggling with uh, personal institutional identifiers. It's very funny how I learned actually about ROAR. I, I was chatting with a colleague of mine from Leibniz Information Center, and I was like uh, sharing my experience, how difficult it is to match strings of institutions like Czech and English names, we have a lot of troubles. And she said, why are you not using ROAR? And here I am. So <laughs> why not using ROAR? Why not making your life easy? Uh, so at uh, the Czech government uh, office, we are um, doing some research evaluation procedure every year, tracking uh, performance, uh, scientific performance of research organizations. And it has many different parts. One of the major parts I want to um, focus on is so-called module two. It's based on bibliometric statistics. So it uh, relies a lot on data collection, a lot on data uh, cleaning and uh, dealing with uh, research organization identifiers is one of the major issues in this, um, in this procedure. So um, there are, two main data sources we are using. One of them is uh, Web of Science and JCR uh, list of journals uh, on the one side. On the other side, there is a national R&D database, uh, CRIS system, which uh, keeps records of all research outputs, not only journal publications, but other types. And we are matching and comparing these two databases. We are trying to find the balance and consistency between them, especially in terms of uh, affiliations. And um, we are producing, so these are inputs, which we're using and as outputs, we produce um, graphics and summary statistics, both at national level and institutional level. Uh, we are also relying on um, field classification to uh, focus on specific fields of science. But uh, let, me, let me just give a brief overview of kinds of graphical outputs we are working on and why ROAR uh, could be important uh, in uh, producing them. So one type of outputs we are um, producing are uh, totally based on the national Czech uh, R&D database. So we are not relying on um, external data sources and we are just summarizing by fields of science or uh, types of organizations, what kind of research they are doing, applied or basic. And we are talking about the publicly funded research organizations in the Czech Republic. Uh, as another type of output, we also focus on the quality structure of uh, journal publications. That's why we are using JCR from Web of Science. And at this, at this point, we are Again, mainly uh, relying on just one data source. This is Web of Science. We are doing some uh, consistency checks with national database, but 
as you can see, like uh, it, main statistics are at the national level uh, focused on specific fields, not institutional level. But most importantly, another type of output we are uh, concerned about is uh, the so-called productivity or number of publications per person at the institutional level where we actually need to identify and to match and link uh, specific research outputs to specific research organizations. Uh, that's why we are using both databases. We are getting a list of publications from Web of Science, but we need to find out which research organizations and, and people uh, produce them um, based on the uh, Czech uh, national database. So there are some issues and difficulties which arise in this procedure of, of matching two databases. On the national database side, uh, one, um, one particular issue, one particular uh, challenge is that um, the database is constructed uh, from the user side. So organizations are self-reporting their outputs to the database. And sometimes they forget to do that or they avoid doing that for, for different reasons. And for in that case, we are adding missing, uh, missing publications from the Web of Science database uh, based on affiliation uh, name. The, by affiliation name here, I mean the uh, clean version of uh, address screen, which Web of Science um, includes in the metadata of research uh, publications, uh, the so-called enhanced name or uh, organization name. And uh, so that's that's the main uh, unique identifier of organization which we are relying on while matching uh, names of, of organizations between Czech and English names. Another issue may arise when uh, some authors may have multiple affiliations, but they indicate only some of them when they submit papers to journals. Again, we are uh, we are using Web of Science as uh, main verification source, so we do not include so we do not count paper for research organization which was not mentioned by author while submitting paper to journal. Uh, on the side of Web of Science, issues might also arise because this aff clean affiliation screen uh, does not uh, exist uh, all the time. There are some cases when there is only address, uh, but no, no uh, clean name of organization. So we attempt to infer affiliations ourselves using not so sophisticated algorithms, but just manually matching them. Uh, because we know uh, that they are supposed to be they are supposed to be reported by a specific organization, but Web of Science for some reason did not manage to uh, to infer a clean name of uh, of this organization. Another issue is that, for example, Czech Academy of Sciences, as a large institution, has institutes, and Web of Science does not indicate names of specific institutes in in publication metadata. So we are again doing that manually. And sometimes um, this uh, address to affiliation routine done by uh, Web of Science uh, does not work or perfectly. So there are some incorrect affiliations reported there. And we rely on feedback from research organizations which tell us that these specific outputs should not be counted or should be counted because there is a, there is a mistake in the Web of Science data. And um, so we need a systematic uh, solution. We need a systematic approach to deal with this matching. You see on the right-hand side, there is a small example of one of, of largest universities in Czech Republic, Charles University, which has around 800 different variations of uh, address or uh, affiliation name streams in Web of Science. And there is, there is definitely a large scope for for discrepancies and it would simplify and simplify our life. It would uh, make the data collection more consistent and systematic if this organization had ROAR and we could identify it on both sides, on the national uh, database side and Web of Science uh, through this uh, unique identifier, not through just um, guessing and, uh, and um, uh, algorithmically uh, matching. So, uh, Czech Republic uh, so far has 190 out of 194 evaluated organizations uh, having their ROAR identifiers, thanks to National Technical Library. 
So um, the only question is uh, whether uh, Web of Science uh, has um, the potential to integrate uh, raw identifiers to, to the database and have this as one of fields in the metadata which we uh, retrieve from their um, you know, databases. As a not effective way, we see that this uh, this uh, enhanced names or affiliation strings cleaned through machine learning algorithms will be matched with ROAR because this will actually leave all these discrepancies there in the data. But as a potentially ideal solution, it would be great if ROARs could be linked to uh, journal databases or boards it where uh, people could manually, like, well, uh, where uh, all sorts of publications could manually report uh, their roars and uh, this information would come from journals and from authors, not from the machine learning algorithms. So I leave here scope for discussion and your thoughts and suggestions, and we are looking forward to roar integration into Web of Science. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's really fascinating. Um, we are going to save uh, all questions uh, to the end. I already have a few uh, that I would like to. Uh like to ask, but I think you're going to be pleased with our next presentation. <laughs> um, so Tilla, I'm handing over uh, slide control to you. Great. And I'm going to hear about uh, your plans to integrate Roar into Web of Science. Yeah, yeah. This seems perfect to follow up, <laughs> uh, follow the, the previous uh, presentation. So hi, everyone. I'm Tilla Edmonds. I am um, at Clarivate, and I work with the Web of Science content. Um, and that includes uh, bibliographic policy, which is how we index the metadata. And um, I'm also involved in how we um, curate and unify those organizations that were previously mentioned. So I am really excited to be able to speak to this audience today about a feature that's coming next month um, related to ROAR integration. And I'll preface this by saying that this is one of, this is the first step of um, potential multiple steps that, that we will um, evolve over time. Um, so what's coming next month? Um, essentially what we've done is that we've resolved all the um, unified web of science organizations, um, similar to what was previously mentioned, to a ROAR identifier. And we've added those ROAR IDs into those um, organization profiles. Um, so this has enabled us to um, include us uh, a search capability where you can either search the organization name and now you can search that ROAR identifier. This is using the affiliation field. So um, when you search for the ROAR ID in the affiliation field, you'll get the same amount of results back. Um, this is retrospective, so that identifier has been added to all the existing Web of Science records that have that um, unified organization name. Um, so in this particular example, you can see that it goes back several, several, um, many, many years. So um, we are showing the ROAR in the full record. And when that um, ROAR is available, you can click a link and you have two options. Um, you can go to the ROAR profile at ROAR.org and view the ROAR information, um, or you can do another search in the Web of Science using that ROAR identifier. We're also making the ROAR identifier um, available um, for you know, discovery if you're using the affiliation search index tool. So when you're looking up an organization um, to you know, confirm uh, the name or you know, find the, the specific organization that you want to search in the Web of Science, there's additional information um, be, you know, beyond all the address variants that was uh, the example shown in the previous um, presentation. Now you will be able to find that ROAR ID in that particular organization profile.
We're also um, adding the support to the Web of Science Expanded API. So just like you can search um, the ROAR identifier in the web application, you can search for that ROAR identifier in the API. And now the um, ROAR identifier is going to be returned in the results. So, um, as I mentioned before, this is step one of our integration that we're that we're planning. This is evolving. Um, the uh, kind of going back to the previous problem discussed in in the earlier presentation, we are kind of tackling this similar to how we um, approach or uh, researcher identifiers. So we've you know included identif um, information from. Uh, first, it was initially researcher ID, but now ORCID. And then we also added support where we can capture the ROAR when it's provided in the published material. That's the support that we're um, planning for um, next year. That way we can kind of tackle this problem in two directions. When it's provided by the publisher, we want that to be available. We want to capture it and, and um, make sure that, that we're um, including that um, when we're indexing. And then if it's not available, um, we want to try and use our other tools so that we can include it um, through the, you know, the other unification process that we have in place. So that's um, that's what I wanted to share with this group today. I'm looking forward to any questions. Thank you so much, Tilla. Uh, I I think that's extremely exciting. I think a lot of people on the call are are thrilled to see that as well. Um, I have many questions, but I will open the floor instead to others who may have questions for one or or other of our presenters, or indeed for us. And you can feel free to just unmute and ask that if you like. Uh, Carol Melzak uh, does ask, how many unified Web of Science organizations have you managed to match? So I think that's for you, Tilla. Yeah, that's for me. Um, so currently we've matched roughly around 13,000, but we, um, it, it, something I didn't mention that I should have, was that obviously there are a lot more ROAR organizations in the ROAR um, registry. We're going to continue to add those over time. So we're not going to, you know, what we have today is not going to be what we will have in the next three months and six months. So we are going to continue to add those, those um, new ROAR organizations as well as try and in increase the matching that we have today. Are you doing that on the basis of like the, the most used organizations in Web of Science or, you know what I mean? The most um, I mean, historically, the way we've we've kind of tackled it, and this is a problem that we've been working on for for many, many years, is, you know, we, we kind of base it on volume initially, like the highest uh, representation within the Web of Science database. We would work on those and then kind of go down and down and down. Uh, Katarina Jandorova, who is on our uh, curation board, asks, can I set up alerts from Web of Science through ROAR now? So using a ROAR as part of your search and creating an alert, um, yes, I that should work. Just like right. you would be able to set it up for an, a regular affiliation search. Um, it's based on that query. And I think that's launching next month in October. So presumably not right now, but not once, right now. Yes, thank you. Once this features launch, and we will we will um, try to publicize this um, a great deal once you do launch it. Yeah. Other questions? Um, Tarash, I actually have a, a question for you, um, which is I'm. You mentioned that, you know, part of what you do, part of your work is to produce these visualizations and essentially data. Uh, and I'm curious about uh, who who consumes those? Who, who are those for? Who who are you uh, presenting your work to and why? Maybe my colleague Michal could <laughs> could be could give more information. I'm 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 just data analyst and um, responsible for all this boring data processing stuff. Uh, my boss is Michal, who knows about the final use of these visualizations. Sure. Uh, hello, 
um, the the core users are usually uh, people from from the policy making sphere. You know, the people who are managing research organizations and also the level of management of the whole national levels of money distribution, because uh, most of the research in Czech Republic is done uh, through the public funded and public research organizations. So it's a very specific environment uh, from this point of view. And uh, so it, it has its, its specific. So that's the answer. No, I think that that definitely answers my question. Um, people in the policy sphere. Um, yeah. 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 That's that's really fascinating. Um, uh, do, uh, for, Tilla, it, I have a, a question for you as well. Um, but let me first uh, answer a question in the chat. Um, John Lewis, who is with Cambridge University Press, asks where Web of Science institution names diverge from the Roar name, does the Roar database carry the name as an alias and other name? I think that that's actually, um, I believe that the, the answer to that question is, it depends um, that it, it might. So essentially any system that has a lot of affiliation data is going to have many, many variations on that name stored in their own database. So we're not, for instance, um, taking from Web of Science all of the name variants they have for all of their institutions. Uh, the name variants in ROAR are just the name variants in ROAR. I know Carly, who works with uh, the Department of Energy, they store many, many name variants. A lot of, a lot of databases will even, you know, they, they have misspellings and things like that, which we don't do in ROAR. What we curate in ROAR is sort of official alternate names for a particular institution. Um, John, does that answer your question? Uh, it does, thank you. Um, I just thought, you know, Web of Science names would be reasonably official, I would say. <laughs> um, it's just, uh, it was just a question really because we, you know, we uh, use the raw quite a lot in our, um, in our workflows and, uh, and this, this web of science development is, is really exciting because obviously when we are asking authors about the names um, of, the, of the institutions where the research has been done, uh, depending on where you are in the world, of course, people are entering in um, university names in all sorts of ways. And uh, for our search mechanisms, um, we try, we are trying to put in as many uh, uh, official, you know, ways that we can we can capture and get people to identify the raw for their correct institution. So. Um, the many official variants that we can capture, sort of the better, really, um, because we want we want to pull in that that raw ID. We want them to be able to find that raw ID. So that, that's why I was asking, really, because we make use of all of your um, your alias names and other name data um, through the API um, and the the data dump. So that's that's why I was asking, really. Yeah, Tilla, can, can you tell us more about what kinds of alternate names, name variants are um, in Web of Science? Um, well, I mean, we have the, the primary affiliation name and uh, that, that's kind of the official name. We have um, some, I mean, we're focusing more like on the address variants, particularly to match that particular Web of Science record to the affiliation. Um, typically, what we would do is is we take that uh, address string, and there is a process where we apply a Web of Science policy version of the address, and that standardizes the actual institution name variations. Um, and that's kind of just historically how we've kind of handled that. There's no particular kind of name variant that we're kind of curating at the organization level um, currently it, it's more we're standardizing how that uh, institutional name is captured um, that it kind of then is is normalized and unified and when you say address do you mean literally street address or mostly just um like city and country or street address um 
institutional. I mean, it, it, there's, you know, many components to an address. Um, it, it can include the parent organization and then, you know, intermediary uh, child organizations, street address, city, um, country, and, and zip or postal code. And Riley, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything else about name variants in ROAR. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to, but. <laughs> um. Um, I, I don't think there's anything I could add that would <laughs> add anything to this conversation right now, unfortunately. <laughs> no problem. Don't want to. Okay, so we have about uh, three more minutes left. Um, any further, further questions? All right. Well, um, we will uh, go ahead and end this call and we hope to see you at a future ROAR event. Thank you all so much um, for participating. And if you do need to get in touch, you can always contact us at either of these email addresses and do be sure to sign up for our next call. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.